hello all, and can, can people hear me at the back? I said, excellent, great stuff. Um, I heard a cruel rumour going around during the coffee break that a lot of people weren't going to come back in. Sure, it's only a teacher after the coffee break. How did he get into the place? You know? But uh, yeah, my name is, is um, Pat McCormack. I'm a principal of a secondary school in Dublin. I'm a, a qualified teacher of history and English and information and communication technology, so I pray to God this doesn't go wrong. Um, I'm a qualified guidance counsellor as well, and I'm the parent of a child with autism, Maeve, beautiful girl, 11 years of age, and along with other parents and behaviour analysts, uh, ran a school for children with autism for a number of years uh, called Achieve ABA. Um, sadly, uh, no longer with us uh, because we ran out of funding, um, and that'll come up as part of this presentation. But it's, it's a great privilege to be here to talk um, to you and to talk a little bit about uh, the history and the present role of ABA in Irish schools. Uh, before I begin, I want to begin by giving thanks to all those people, uh, professionals and parents, who over the years have taken court cases, who have advocated and campaigned for the rights, not only of children with autism, but children, children and adults with other special educational needs and disabilities, um, for the right to evidence-based interventions. And I was tempted to begin today's talk with Didn't We Almost Have It All by Whitney Houston to sing it. Okay, I have a, I have a hell of a singing voice. If you're ever around the pubs of Dublin, you'll quickly learn that. Um, but I won't begin with it. But it, it does kind of set a theme and a tone because in the Republic of Ireland, we almost had it all. And then we snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. So, um, a, a brief history of special education in the Republic of Ireland. Well, as you see, the number of state-recognised special schools, we had one in 1950, and by the beginning of the 1960s, this had risen to 33. And this was the slow recognition by voluntary bodies, not really the state, but by voluntary bodies, that children with special needs, it wasn't really enough to kind of leave them floundering and wasting away in home environments with no effort whatsoever made to cater for their needs. So there was a growth in schools during that period. But it was in 1990 where Ireland held the presidency of the European uh, community. and um, They put forward a proposal for the integration of children with special educational needs into mainstream education. This was accepted and it was adopted by other ministries for education in Europe. And in 1992, well, then Ireland ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and its assertion that all children have a right to equal education. And this sparked a period of consultation and it led to a series of reports. I'll move this over this way. And there was the report of the Special Education Review Committee. And it's actually in that report where the current model essentially has its, has its firm roots because that, that envisaged a system of, of provision for children with special educational needs in special classes where there'd be a pupil-teacher ratio of six to one with one special need assistant. Now, the change that's there is that it's six to one with two special needs assistants now. But then we had the Services for Persons with Autism report. Of course, the UNESCO Salamanca statement, which once again is trust towards the inclusion of people with special educational needs in school settings, in mainstream school settings. And then we had Charting Our Education Future, which was a white paper on, on education in 1995 in um, the Republic of Ireland. And just Cirque said, the 1993 report, that no one type of educational provision will meet the needs of all children with autism. We're considered most appropriate that students with ASD should continue to be placed in schools for pupils with emotional, uh, sorry, emotional and behavioural disorders. If children with ASD are to be enrolled in other forms of special schools, staffing provision should be made for them on a six to one pupil teacher ratio with one special needs assistant. So that, that was the, the roots of the model that would grow from that. And of course, you see, it begins to talk about that there's no evidence that one intervention is suitable for all children with autism. And this is perhaps where our eclectic model grows from, a reading or misreading of that. So then in the Republic, again, we had the 1998 Education Act. And that enshrined in law the concept that all children have a right to access and participate in the education system according to their potential and ability. In 2004, we had the Education of Persons with Special Educational Needs Act, the Epson Act, most of which was never enacted. And that said children with SEN have a right to an appropriate education just as children without such needs have. And that parents of children with SEN must be enabled to play a greater participatory role in the education of their children. And this is where parents are really coming to the fore and they say, well, we need to ask parents what it is they want for their children. And we'll often hear about 
around disability legislation, disability advocacy about the rights of the child and the voice of the child or the voice of the adult. Then we ask ourselves the question, of course, well, if the child actually doesn't have a voice, in other words, if the child is non-verbal, how is that child's voice expressed? Well, it's probably best expressed through the, through the parents and guardian of that child. And then the 2005 Disability Act, it upheld the right of children with special educational needs to an education appropriate to their needs, and that the child can have an assessment of need carried out by a multidisciplinary team with the aim of providing a statement of the health and educational needs, if any, occasioned to the person by the disability. And you'll see there, no behaviour analyst need apply. Okay, so you are not on the multidisciplinary teams. Your skill sets, they have no part to play in that area. So, the importance of the Disability Act, let me tell you from a parent and from a child or young adults with autism point of view. There's an organisation in the Republic of Ireland called the National Educational Psychological Service. That's a branch of the Department of Education. NEPS, when it makes its recommendations for provisions or supports that a child needs, must make those recommendations in line with Department of Education policy. I know that the psychologists here will recognise there could be an ethical problem here. What if the needs of the child and the, the, so the needs of the child in terms of educational interventions or psychological interventions and so on aren't, don't fall under the umbrella of government policy or Department of Education policy. So the recommendations are based on what the department offers rather than what the child needs. The Disability Act in its assessment of need, that makes recommendations for the child irrespective of what policy of the Department of Education it is. So, so they, they look at it from a point of view of what are the best things that we can do for this child Parents go for the assessment of need because, irrespective of the capacity of the departments of education and health to deliver it, at least now you have a picture, a professional picture of where your child is and you can advocate for those services. Even if they're not being supplied, you can advocate for them. So, then we had the 2001 Task Force on Autism Report and I'll jump forward into the 2009 International Review of Literature, which was commissioned by the Department of Education and carried out by our National Council for Special Education. And both of those reports reached a common conclusion. And it said that there is currently no evidence that a single intervention or solution will meet the needs of all learners with ASD. So a range of options, types of educational setting and interventions should be available and chosen to fit the profile of the child or young person. Now, how that was read in the Irish context was once again the eclectic, or sometimes you'll hear now, the blended model, where you have children in school settings where the, 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 the teacher might, now I stress might because there's no requirement under Irish law for the teacher to have any qualifications beyond initial teacher education qualification where they're teaching children with the most complex disabilities and the most complex challenges. So there's no requirement for that. And the skill set levels as we see later on are quite low. A 2009 report suggests that the number of teachers operating in the system with, with any postgraduate qualifications in the areas of ASD is about 5%. So there's no requirement for them to hold any specialist training. Okay? So this was the model that was chosen, so this eclectic model. Now you could have said, well, I might have read that in another way. I might have read that, well, we could have an ABA school that's staffed with teachers and ABA therapists that looks to meet the needs of those children who recommend that they attend those schools. And we can have children attending mainstream settings because once again, that's deemed to be best needed to suit their needs. Okay, and other types of school settings. Once again, I hate to use that term, child-centered, but in the real sense of the word, child-centered. Um, but that wasn't what we got. We got uh, an eclectic, blended approach. So the Department of Education referenced both reports regularly as supporting its policy on the education of children with autism. So when it talks about the evidence base supporting its work, it speaks of the 2001 uh, Task Force on Autism Report and it speaks of the 2009 uh, International Review of Literature. It's worth pointing out as well that in the 2001 Task Force on Autism Report, it refers to ABA or behaviour analysis as an approach. The department then would always refer to behaviour analysis as an approach, never as a science. One thing you'll be glad to know through parent, through parents pushing it, asking, asking, asking the questions and getting beha pro professional behaviour analysts on board. Um, the minister, in answer to a parliamentary question, eventually said, well, whilst ABA may be a science, okay, there's still no evidence that it's, it's, it's effective in meeting the needs of all children with autism. I'll, I'll send you the reference. Email me, I'll send you the reference. It makes great bedtime reading if you can't sleep. Um, so then, 
1998, a noteworthy year, and why was that? Well, the Education Act envisaged an inclusive system of education where a recognised school shall ensure that the educational needs of all students, including those with a disability for other special educational needs, are identified and provided for. And in this, it's the first year that autism is recognised as a distinct disability by the Department of Education. Because as we see, prior to 1998, there was no specific education provision for children with ASD. Children with autism were usually defined by some other accompanying condition, such as general learning disability, behavioural disorder, or speech and language impairment. And they tended to be referred to and enrolled in special classes for these disabilities. And that was in the preamble to a 2006 inspection report that was written by Eamon Stack, who was the then Chief Inspector of the Department of Education and now heads up the board of the National Council for Special Education. So, in 1998, also a great year. Once again, remember what I said at the beginning, Whitney Houston, didn't we almost have it all? In 1998, the DES provided funding for a pilot applied behaviour analysis school for children with autism. This was parent-driven. Parents knew, once again, there was no services for their children. And they campaigned and they lobbied. And in Cork, where the, the then minister, Michal Martin, it was his constituency, parents there successfully lobbied for the opening of an ABA school because there was no facilities there, there was no capacity in the schools to meet, their, to meet the needs of the children. So against the advice of officials, uh, Minister Martin opened, uh, provided funding for the opening of this school. The DES, it was also the year where they offered a framework for personnel provision for autism spectrum disorder, what they term units attached to mainstream schools. Unit is a term you'll never hear me using referring to ASD units. Units might, may, might help us think of hospitals or old style psychiatric mental hospitals. We educate children in classrooms. At the very least, if you're not going to provide for them, at least provide, don't provide for them in rooms called classrooms. Don't call them units. Terminology is important, what we call people and what we say and where we put them. Okay. This would operate under what became known as the eclectic model of provision, pupil-teacher ratio of six to one with two special needs assistants. There was no requirement for teachers to hold any qualifications in special educational needs or autism spectrum disorders to have any knowledge or skill sets in those areas. And initial teacher education programs would have minimal, have minimal content at that time and to this day pretty much the same related to ASD. At the time, speaking with teachers, um, it was one hour over the course of the three years as part of a general special education module. So the first state-funded ABA school opens its doors in Cork as part of a pilot scheme to examine the effectiveness of that model. Now, keep that in mind as well, pilot scheme, to examine the effectiveness of it. So then, the only inspection that was carried out into ABA schools, or as they were referred to by the Department of Education in the Republic of Ireland, was in 2006, and the report was called an evaluation of educational provision for children with autistic spectrum disorders, and it was conducted a couple of years after the schools had opened, and three years prior to the actual eventual publication of, of the report. Um, it's commonly referred to as the orange report because of the orange cover. It rolls off the tongue a little bit easier. Um, and it was reported by the Inspector of the Department of Education and Science. And as I said, the only inspection carried out. And I'm going to read some of the things that it had, some of the observations and commendations that it made about the ABA centres. Now, it looked at provision in other models as well, but I don't have time to go through that. And I, I will go off on a slight tangent. I'm a big fan of Gaelic football. And in 1992, Dublin played Donegal in the All-Ireland football final. And Dublin were red-hot favourites, so much so that already in Dublin, not that we'd be known for arrogance or anything like that. They were already producing mugs and pens and so on with Dublin All-Ireland Champions 1992. When I watch replays of that match for the first 25 minutes, I am still convinced that Dublin will win. The hope rises in my heart and I feel fantastic. Even though I know that Dublin got destroyed by Donegal that day because it looked so good and so promising for the first 25 minutes. When you read the Orange Report, when I read the commendation, I think, Jesus, it's all going to work out well. We're going to get our ABA schools. We're going to have behaviour analysts recognised to work either in schools, what we might term ABA schools, but also in mainstream schools, a synergy of skill sets between teachers and behaviour analysts. So what did they say? Well, they said, a commendable emphasis was placed on the importance of parental involvement in the ABA centres. We'll go back to, remember Epson talking about the parent voice? 
Parents' satisfaction that the education provision in the centres and their children's needs was high, so parents were really happy with what was being done with their children. Parents' comments showed a high level of satisfaction with their children's placement in the ABA centres. They were happy with where their children were going. The parents endorsed the opportunity provided to work with their children in the centres, which enabled them to apply the observed approaches at home, so it wasn't site-specific. They were learning skill sets that they could actually apply in the home and in the environment with their children. The emphasis on developing homeschool links and providing regular parent education sessions was also endorsed. The children were described as happy and respected, and parents referred to the positive manner in which this had influenced the quality of life for the whole family. As the parent of a child with autism, I can talk, ad no I can talk forever. I'll stay here afterwards and keep Whitlaw Hall open till midnight to talk about the impact of a child with autism on a family unit. Okay? The children had access to a curriculum based on a number of content areas, which included attentional skills, receptive and expressive language, fine and gross motor skill development, daily living and social skills, literacy, numeracy, and the management of maladaptive behavior. They had access to content areas based on their identified individual needs, and a hierarchical sequence that ranged from the least difficult component of the task to the most difficult, exactly what we do with children. I want to work in this school. Planning for individual, teacher, or individual children's education programs was systematic, coherent, and detailed. Cohesive links were evident between long-term planning, short-term, and classroom practice. All ABA, all ABA centres in the report, there was three of them, displayed a commitment to facilitating the inclusion of children in mainstream schools as soon as this was considered practical. So they weren't looking to keep them there forever. Jesus, don't let them go because these kids are doing fantastic and they keep our grades up. They were saying, as soon as we can, we're looking to help these children transition into mainstream class settings. A decision to include a child in a mainstream class was based on an assessment of the appropriateness of such a placement for the individual child. Staff members demonstrated a clear understanding of their roles and responsibilities, and learning and teaching activities were predictable and well organized. 98% of parents, 98%, okay, stated that they were either very satisfied or satisfied that the curriculum being implemented in the center met their children's assessed needs, whilst 2% reported dissatisfaction. No parent was very dissatisfied with the curriculum. And then you'll see the little piece in red. Remember I said about Dublin and Donegal? First 25 minutes, here's the 26th minute. Staff members were less familiar with the principles and subject areas of the primary school curriculum and the draft curriculum guidelines for teachers of students with general learning disabilities. And a concern was expressed that centres had not been granted permanent status, which was described by parents as a source of stress and worry. So, behaviour analysts weren't trained teachers and weren't familiar with the primary school guidelines. So after all, all the good stuff, you weren't moon tours, to use the Irish word. So the behaviour analysts, the ABA therapists working in the school, weren't teachers. And this was a, a major difficulty, major problem. But it didn't have to be an insurmountable problem. It still doesn't. So a DES inspectorate presentation to the Joint Committee on Education and Science in the same year, and which once again, remember, was the inspectorate that had done the previous report. And this was by Gabriel Harrison, who was then Assistant Chief Inspector to Eamon Stack, who was the, 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 the principal author. Well, sorry, he wasn't the principal author. He was the Chief Inspector who wrote the preamble to the, to the other report. But following this, a joint committee on education and science in, the, in, the, uh, the, in our doll in the Parliament asked the Inspector to come in and to present to them on their findings in the area. And Gabriel Harrison, and once again, Maybe someone from the floor can explain the logic to me. He says, autistic children have a specific way of learning and interacting with the world, which they do not hold in common with the way other children learn, and this must be taken into account. It is another reason teachers need to know about autism. Matters specific to autism are not part of the normal developmental frame of reference and not shared with other children who have special needs. So he's recognizing that if you use that term neurotypical child or neurotypical student, that a lot of students with autism are presenting with manifestations, with challenges and so on, that aren't, that teachers wouldn't have experience of working with, that teachers aren't seeing in classes with neurotypical children. So he's kind of suggesting that there's a difference here, there's something else that teachers need to learn. But then he goes on in the same presentation. When we consider our framework for the sort of people who should work with autistic spectrum disorders, our first thought is that they should be teachers. 
if we insist that those who work with all other children should be qualified teachers, the neurotypical children, why should we have a different requirement for a particular subsection of children, unless, of course, those children need other skill sets? And also, it brings down the thing about defining, well, what do you mean by teacher? What is a teacher? Is a teacher someone who has something useful to impart to someone else? So it brings up a big philosophical debate and a big, uh, I suppose, semantics debate as well. But, so on the one hand, we had Gabriel recognising that children with autism might have different challenges and different needs from other children, but they can be met by the same person, that teacher. Okay, 2006. In 2007, there was a, a, a big court case in Ireland, and once again, I, I, I don't have time in the presentation to go through the various different court cases that have been taken by families, not just families of children with autism, but families of children with other disabilities as they're advocating and trying to get what I would consider reasonable resources and supports, and oftentimes evidence-based supports for their children. And the Aquinacon family, they tried to secure state funding for ABA for their son, who had autism, and he had been attending an ABA school. Once again, he was coming to the end of the time in that. And they said, well, this is, this is what the professionals have recommended for him, okay? And they took a case, and they lost the case. And it was 42 days in the Supreme Court. You can imagine, once again, it must feel like being bulldozed into a field. And Judge Perth, who was the presiding judge at the time, he rules that the DES has a policy on the education of children with autism, Model A, and that the minister has the right to decide on education policy. People see, well, the Okunikons lost that case. Okay, so in other words, they were told their child didn't have, a, the state didn't have to pay for ABA access, ABA provision for their child. And oftentimes, they, 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 it's misread as an endorsement of one policy over another. It's actually not that at all. That wasn't Judge Perth's ruling. All Judge Perth said was that the Minister for Education of the day has the right to determine policy. And the policy document that had been put forward by the Department of Education was Model A. Now, I know that if I had a room full of educationalists, experts in special needs education, experts in special need education specialising in the area of autism, and I asked 100 out of 100 put up their hands, I would, I would say 10% would not never have heard of Model A, because like that, it was ephemeral. It was like a firework going off. It puffed in the sky. We were all distracted, and then it disappeared. So what did Model A say? Well, it says Model A confirmed, uh, and uh, it stated that teachers working in ASD classes would receive ABA training prior to taking responsibility for the class. So this was, if you want to use that term, a SOP. It said, well, what we'll actually do, we'll provide training in ABA to teachers before they actually take up a position in a class for children with autism. Not only that, we'll actually provide training, pre-training for special needs assistance. I know in, in, in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, we don't have teaching assistance in classes. We have special needs assistance. And it's very clear that their job is not to be engaged with education at all. It's looking after the care needs of the child. Okay? So, but they would receive training in ABA as well prior to. Now I go back to this, there's no requirement on teachers working in classes for children with autism to have any skills training or to engage in any training uh, concerning special educational needs or autism spectrum disorders. Professional pride means that lots of teachers do, okay, in terms of taking up offers of training, whether it's through special education support service or Middletown Centre for Autism. But there's no requirement, it's not mandatory. Um, SNAs, special need assistants, they don't have any access to state funded training. So they, they, they're not provided with any training. It falls on the teacher to train them when they come back into the class. So we had our ABA schools. After the 2006 report, remember all the good stuff that was in it? 2006, more ABA schools opened, or to use the term that the department used, centres. So more centres opened. Everything was looking good. Remember, it was the only inspection and evaluation carried out of ABA schools. And we had more opening after 2006. But then in 2010, so as I said, it was, two, it was 13, a number of smaller ABA schools, some of these referred to as applicant schools, had also been set up by parents in the hope that these would receive recognition. And these were funded through the pooling of home tuition allowance and personal monies. Home tuition allowance was the money that you received, that if there wasn't a suitable place identified for your child in the state-funded schools, they would provide home tuition allowance so you could basically pay for tutors. At that time, you could use that money to pay for a behaviour analyst to come and work with your child. Um, then it was tightened up, and that was no longer possible. Sorry. 
But what parents would do is they would pool their money and they would um, set up schools because like that, once again, get people working together, get people learning from each other. Um, big socialisation aspect for children as well. And so we, we set up schools. Now I, I didn't achieve ABA was the name of school. Google it, you'll see, you'll find some beautiful pictures of me. Um, and it was a fantastic school. It had been up and running for about a year before uh, we were lucky enough to uh, get a place in it and to join with those parents and fight the good fight. Um, then the DS informed the ABA pilot schools that funding for the scheme was going to end. Once again, there was no inspection carried out. There was no evaluation carried out. As in our school, we had one person who was, uh, had worked as a chief executive of a major company and was a qualified chartered accountant. And they basically went forensically through all the monies that were being put into the ABA pilot schools. Now, they were very conservative in the estimate because they didn't include money for ancillary services, for example, like bu bus, uh, uh, bus travel into the schools or any supports that the child might be receiving through the local health uh, programs and health boards. But they estimated that over the, over the years of the scheme, that over 70 million was spent on it. Now, where would you get a pilot program run by the state, 70 million spent on it, and no evaluation about whether it was effective or not, but just a decision made at the end of a guillotine, that's it, game over, ball burst, go home. Okay? So, that, so there was no review to determine the effectiveness or otherwise of the pilot program. To continue to receive funding, schools must close as ABA schools and reopen as schools for children with autism and other complex needs. These will operate under the DES policy of eclectic provision staffed by trained primary teachers and special needs assistants. The only SOP, and I use that term once again, given to the schools, was that they would be allowed to keep a director of education for a period up to seven years. This director of education could be a behaviour analyst to work in conjunction with the staff in the school. There's no guarantee for that position after the seven year period. The behaviour analysts who I trust, we have a national framework for qualifications in the Republic of Ireland. So an undergraduate degree, once you get that, it's, it's a level eight, an honours degree. A postgraduate qualification, whether it's a postgraduate diploma or a master's, would be a level nine. Um, the behaviour analysts that we had working with the children were level 8, level 9, and we had oversight from a doctor uh, uh, in, in uh, behaviour analysis. They were offered re-employment in these schools as special needs assistants. To become a special needs assistant, you need qualification level 3 on the national framework qualifications. Here's the question for you. What happened to all the behaviour analysts? They were offered the same money. They began to leave because they had professional pride and they actually wanted to apply their skills in areas where they might be valued. So some of them left to pastures new, other countries are benefiting from their skills, others went into our Department of Health working in various different areas. Um, so very few stayed in the school system. So the ABA tutors that employed in ABA schools offered continuation. So faced with this, a number of parents and professionals set up what was called an ABA schools working group. And this was a, a, a last gasp effort, trying to, to convince the department and lobby support not to close the ABA schools without at least conducting an evaluation to determine their effectiveness or not. Um, I was on that working group. And once again, if anyone would like to see the work of that working group, I will happily um, send it to you. And what, some of the recommendations that we had from it, and it was quite a long document that we produced, but it said that recognition of applicant patron bodies under which all existing ABA pilot schools and new schools can seek school recognition, existing ABA pilot schools to seek recognition as primary schools for children with autism for children up to the age of 18 with a transition period up, of up to three years to give us time to work with the department on getting a, a model, okay, a, a workable, uh, agreeable model. New schools to submit applications for the same primary school for children with autism status under agreed patron bodies. And then applied behaviour analysis will be central to the schools. The principal and teaching staff to hold approved behaviour analysis qualification in addition to recognised teacher qualifications. We said this will take time, but what we were looking at was and we, were, we, we began work in terms of contacting departments and universities and so on, asking is it possible to actually put together programmes and courses, contacting the teaching council. Probably doing the work perhaps that the Department of Education, if it was really interested in the area, should have done, or maybe some of the advocacy bodies should have done. But 
Then standards to be maintained by these dual qualified staff members and monitored by an annual evaluation process, the precise nature of which needs to be discussed and agreed with the Department of Education. And during the transition period to carry out an agreed research project to review the outcomes of the ABA pilot schools. That was actually a recommendation from the department's own fund, the 2009 International Review. We should conduct a pilot, and nothing has ever been done. All of that data, wherever it is now, it's probably sitting there somewhere. I don't know whether you could get it all back together or not. But it is a little bit of indictment of the, of the Department of Education, I would contend, that no evaluation was conducted into the effectiveness or otherwise of the ABA schools after over 10 years and 70 million um, euros. But our, our proposals were not accepted. We had conducted the working group. There was, there was a group in, in the Republic of Ireland, still there, called Irish Autism Action, which was very closely aligned with the, a, well, identified with the ABA schools, rightly or wrongly, very closely identified with the ABA schools. And they had a negotiating team working with the department. Um, we formed a working group to look at it, an alternative to what the department were offering, which was essentially transition across into becoming a special school operating purely under the department <coughs> model. Um, we brought our proposal to the, to, to the IAA and they decided not to submit it to the department. They, they accepted the department's policy. So, to give you a little, a, what, what, what do former ministers for education say when, when well, in February 2008, there was two very significant statements for those interested in the history of ABA provision in Ireland. Former Minister for Education, Mary O'Rourke, she gave her view that there was a lingering animosity within the Department of Education. And once again, I will send on the full quotes. If anyone's interested in this, I'll send on links to everything. That there was a lingering animosity within the Department of Education, which has caused a blockage in the provision of ABA therapy, and that she felt, in an interview with RTE, that the door is not fully open within the Department of Education to the idea of embracing ABA, as I said, in a full-blooded way, 10 years after the first ABA school opened its doors with state funding. And then, the next one is from Rory Quinn. At the time, Rory Quinn was the spokesperson for Labour on education. He then became the Minister for Education. And I'm going to ask you what you think he did after this statement. The DES refusal to recognise the merit of the ABA method has more to do with institutional rigidities and conservatism within the civil service than a real, honest and open evaluation of the effectiveness of the ABA method. Okay, we know he doesn't use the word science, but we won't get hung up on that for this particular point. And the rigidity of the Department of Education and Science relates to the definition of a primary school teacher, which simply does not make sense in the context of a trained professional with a third level qualification, but not that of a primary school teacher who is engaged in utilization of the ABA method. Basically, he was saying, your definition of a teacher is too narrow. A teacher is the one who can most effectively meet the needs of the child. Then he became Minister for Education. What did he do? Nothing, right? The policy stayed exactly the same. And I asked the minister one time, Minister, what has changed? And uh, his next sentence was, thank you, Mr. McCormick, for coming along. The meeting has concluded. There we go. I don't have that one on tape. That would have been illegal. Um, so why do I care? What does it matter? Look at me. I'm full. I am replete with social capital. I am educated. I'm a qualified teacher. I know how to advocate for my child. I'm blessed in that if my child needs some therapies, I can afford perhaps to get some of those in a private capacity. So why do I care? Well, I am a qualified teacher after all, and I'm the guy the DES wants, the Department of Education wants. Sometimes I'm the guy they want in the way that the posse wants the outlaw, okay? But I'm also the guy they want in the sense that I have all the qualifications required to step into any classroom in the Republic of Ireland and to start teaching children with autism, irrespective of the needs of those children, irrespective of the complexity of their need. I have the qualification. I can draw down the salary. Any of the behavioural analysts here, you cannot. Okay? And I kind of care about that. So, the evidence base that supports the effectiveness of ABA interventions for children with ASD. Once again, I don't know if you can have infinite numbers of slides in a slideshow, but I could probably populate it fairly heavily 
with the evidence base that is there for the effectiveness of behaviour analysis and use in educational settings, and interventions and so on and so forth. There was two major ones from 2009 meta-analyses, the National Standards Project and the State of Maine's report. I won't labour on them because I'm, sure oh, I'm sure that people are very familiar with them. Then I'm concerned about the lack of research in an Irish context around effective models of educational interventions for children with ASD. So how do we know that what we're doing is working? We're not carrying out any evaluation of its effectiveness. When you have, for example, that eclectic or blended model, and a teacher might have done some training in the areas of teach, in the areas of ABA, or what as they call it, CABA, Contemporary Applied Behaviour Analysis. The courses are usually one day up to a maximum of five days duration. They're the ones that are provided through SESS. Of course, it is open for teachers to go and do postgraduate training through the university's um, evening study and so on. But where's the oversight? How do we know about the outcomes for children? How are the outcomes being measured, or are they being measured at all, either on a school-by-school -school basis or across schools? Is there any kind of oversight helicopter view of what's taking place going on? I would contend that there's not. And then a big one around behaviour analysis. So concerns about the skill shortages and evidence-based education interventions for children with ASD that exist in the professional community of mainstream qualified teachers, including those working in special schools. Now, when Maeve, when my daughter was diagnosed, one of the comforts that people gave to me, or attempted to give, but once again, with goodness in their hearts, was, Jesus, Pat, at least you're a qualified teacher, you'll know what to do. I was a cow looking into a ditch, right? That's what I was. I didn't know what I was being faced with. I, I could not understand, I could not make sense. And the way I describe it to people, it is like being dropped into the middle of an alien, flat, featureless landscape at night with no map. I didn't know what to do or where to go. And believe me, there was times down there in the pit of despair. And thank Christ for human hope and endeavour that we're able to build ladders and hopefully get out of that. But we need help. And we need synergies of skill sets to help us. We need synergies of supports to help us. So, a 2009 survey conducted on behalf of the National Council for Special Education estimates that the number... Oh, apologies, I've pressed the wrong button again. Now, so this was their, their, their own figures from the Department of Education. Funded, now, there's the National Council for Special Education and there's the Department of Education. Now, technically speaking, they're, they're separate entities, okay? They're, se they're separate entities. Um, but they're, they're very closely aligned and the department will provide um, funding for research carried out by the National Council for Special Education and would put a heavy weight on advice given from the National Council for Special Education. But in a piece of, of uh, work commissioned by the National Council for Special Education, it, it, it said that teachers, it estimated that teachers with postgraduate qualifications and special educational needs, so that's in the general area of special education needs, they were estimated between 25 and 33 of, percent of teachers who were then at that time working with children with special educational needs. The percentage figures for those teachers uh, in an autism specific intervention appears to be lower and they said from a total of 988 teachers working in 83 special schools 32 teachers had a graduate certificate in ASD obtained either through St. Patrick's College in Drumcondra or the University of Birmingham and 10 had a diploma in ASD five teachers hold the BCABA qualification from Trinity College three have a master's degree in ASD so they didn't break down the figures, but I broke down the figures. And they said a breakdown of these figures would indicate that 5.06% of teachers have postgraduate qualifications in ASD-specific interventions. This suggests, this is once again why I'm a leading light, an intellectual heavyweight. What I deduced from that was this. This suggests that there is a skill shortage in the Irish education system. You could imagine the round of applause that went up in the Department of Education. Who is this guy? How did we not know about him sooner? He's given us the answer. There's a skill shortage. We have to address it. So that would mean then that you have a 1 in 20 chance, if your child is in a class for children with autism, you have a 1 in 20 chance that the, the person in that classroom has any prior knowledge or prior qualification in autism spectrum disorders working in an educational setting. So, there we go. That's okay. Good enough odds. Um, so, once again, why do I care? Well, concerns about the outcomes of, for children with ASD and for teachers working in areas where they feel under or unqualified. Um, once again, outcomes are hugely important. And a concern that I have is this. The number of parents that I would speak with, where they're despairing and they ask themselves, what is it that I'm not doing for my child? 
Or the other one is, my child isn't capable of and fill in the blank. When perhaps, maybe, just maybe, that the systems that we have established are not meeting the needs of, the, of these children, that these children cannot prosper because the system hasn't been set up in a way that can actually take their needs, take their talents, take um, the challenge that they have and to help them grow. Okay? And then I'm, I'm carrying out a, a, a doctoral study. It's a qualitative piece of work. It's not looking at behaviour analysis at all. It's looking at the experiences of teachers working in an ASD class setting and of principals working in, in schools that are in mainstream schools that cater for children to the ASD class model. And um, concerns that are coming through from teachers is, is, is feelings of being un or underqualified to conduct the work. And concerns coming through from principals are, whilst they feel that they can, their official role, and my official role in, in, in my, my job is le leading the teaching and learning, very occasionally it happens, leading the teaching and learning in the school environment. And principals in the primary schools were saying that whilst they feel very equipped in advising and consulting with teachers in the mainstream classes, they don't feel that they possess those same skill sets and they are not confident in doing the same thing for the classes for children with autism, that they don't have the professional knowledge or capacity to be able to conduct that work. I've also concerns around the lack of ancillary support for students with, with ASD. Some OT and SLT, some education psychology, maybe if you're lucky, or perhaps some people say if you're unlucky, maybe they don't value. But there aren't any behaviour analysts working on the multidisciplinary teams. So when, when, if I go back to the assessment of need, which a lot of parents will go for, do you remember under the Disability Act 2005? Don't forget it, I hope you're taking notes that when we go back to that, and a lot of parents will choose that because like that they feel it will give them the best honest picture of their child under a state model. But there's no access to behaviour. Uh, behaviour analysts don't have any part to, to play in that in terms of the assessment of the child or trying to identify the child's challenges and the child's needs, strategies for dealing with that. Access to behaviour analysis generally only achieved through privately funded access. This is costly and out of reach of so many families. Now, one good little legacy, perhaps, of the work that we did as parents and professionals in the Republic was that there are some, a very small number, of, of early intervention centres where there are behaviour analysts working in those centres. And they are funded through monies from the Department of Health um, and some funding from the Department of Education in, in some circumstances if the child has home tuition allowance. We won't get bogged down in the detail of that. But there are behaviour analysts, but generally, the, once the children uh, reach school going age, that's the end of their time there, then they are moving into the school setting and into the ASD classes. And of course, private funding is out of the reach of so many families. So also, Ireland has no written policy document on the education of children with autism. Something else, parents, once again, we're, we just keep coming back at it, we don't give up, you know. And um, some parents, okay, took cases to the, the Ombudsman for Children, once again trying to advocate for the children's needs. In early 2013, following a complaint made to the Ombudsman for Children by the parent of a child with autism, the Ombudsman recommends that the, the Department of Education would publish a policy on the education of children with autism with ASD. Now remember in this time we'd had the, the ABA schools had opened and closed, no evaluation carried out, a new policy or provision they had given to these schools, plus at this point now they had just shy of 600 ASD classes, catering for about 3,500 children, maybe, maybe catering is the wrong verb, uh, for 3,500 children in primary schools, smaller number at second level, and there was no written policy document, no guidelines. So, so that was early 2013, the Ombudsman recommended, gosh, you know what, we're, we're, we're about 15, 16 years into it now, any chance of writing that stuff down? Okay, so June 11, 2013, once again on foot, of perhaps parents advocating. In a parliamentary question, Tommy Bruin, a TD in North Dublin, asked the minister when this policy document will be published. And the then minister, do you remember Minister Rory Quinn, the guy who said all those good things about behaviour analysts before he was minister? Well, he said, further to the encouragement of the Ombudsman for Children. So the Ombudsman hadn't instructed, he'd encouraged, he'd encouraged them, ah, go on, do it. You know, and mindful that greater clarity on my department's policy on the education of children with autism would be useful for schools and parents. So this would be a useful exercise. 
My department is currently in the process of preparing a comprehensive statement of existing policy within the boundaries of one document. This policy is ongoing and going and going and going. Because if you check on the NCSE website two years later, it says that it's, going to, it's publishing it. Spring 2015. Okay. Now, we must operate off a different time calendar in the Republic of Ireland than the rest of the world, because as far as I know, it is November, still no sign of that policy document. Okay? There is a danger, of course, that if you write things down, people start holding you to it. And lawyers love paperwork. Okay? So, to this date, the policy has not been published. The campaign for initial teacher education programme, so what can we do about it? Campaign for initial teacher education programmes to provide training and evidence-based interventions for students with ASD. In Ireland, we're moving from a three-year to a four-year undergrad programme training primary teachers. And we're moving, we've moved from a one to a two-year master's model of training for secondary school teachers. Maybe there's an opportunity here to start advocating or lobbying in this, uh, teacher training colleges and the department to have more robust content around the area of evidence-based interventions for, for children and adults with autism. To examine opportunities to cross-pollinate teachers and behaviour analysts. So, it, pass legislation that teachers have to marry behaviour analysts, right, in the hope that as things move on, that skill sets, the genetics will start to merge, okay? Or maybe, maybe a more effective way is, is looking at ways where we can have teachers doing modules in behaviour analysis or doing postgraduate work in that area and vice versa. It's not an insurmountable problem. It will take time and what will happen is, perhaps quicker than the marriage thesis, right, we might actually start getting that synergy of skill sets, okay? Work together and also dual qualifications. To campaign for closer cooperation between the Department and the Department of Health to ensure that students with ASD receive ancillary supports and therapies that they require to enable meaningful engagement in school settings, or the creation of a new government department to oversee this area where education meets health. Because at the, at the minute, we have a Department of Education and a Department of Health, they don't really speak to each other. So if you have a child with autism in the school and you say, I think the child needs, needs help in the area of, of speech or occupational therapy, they will say, well, that's an issue for the Department of Health and they don't really speak to each other in any effective way. Sometimes when I talk about looking to try to get them to speak, I, I, the word Pollyanna keeps coming to mind, but you have to hope, you have to be optimistic, and as Brenda Kennelly, the poet, says, you have to begin. Um, also, behaviour analysts must advocate for their profession. And what do I mean by that? As Carola said at the beginning, I've been in the diggings quite a while, and I would consider myself as a, a, a parent who has benefited greatly from the skill sets that behaviour analysts bring, that they have brought to my child, and I've seen them, what they have brought to, to the benefit of other children, and by extension then to our families. But one thing, when the ABA schools closed, and the ABA analysts, or sorry, the, the behaviour analysts were being told we don't recognise your skill sets. We don't value them in an education setting. The jobs that we have for those who are already employed, you're moving from a level eight, level nine positioning to level three recognition. Your pay scale might stay the same, but as you leave, of course, any new people coming in, they, they will be level three qualified. And I was surprised that at the denigration of a profession, that there wasn't a bigger outcry that there wasn't a bigger wave of defence of your science and of your professions. I will say this, and perhaps it's because of the strength of teacher unions and representative bodies. If it had happened to the teaching profession, there would have been, to use an old Irish expression, wigs on the green. That means in the old times, the wigs off, the jukes up, so we're not taking this. We're not having ourselves treated and dealt with in this way. So I, I would appeal, I, I, I don't pretend, I, I don't know the structures in terms of the behaviour analysts, in terms of representative bodies and so on as well, of course, as behaviour analysts would. But if we are to have any hope, you have to be the main spokespersons for your profession. Because only with that do we have any hope of getting that boulder back up the hill. Thank you very much. Okay.